So welcome to Protrusive Students Episode 2. In Episode 1, we introduce you to Emma Hutchison, who's the Protrusive Student. I'll be releasing one episode with her every month to answer questions from a dental student's perspective. And every month we will release some of her revision notes, which are absolutely epic. I'll check them myself on the team brands them. And so all of these notes are gonna go in the crush your exam section of Protrusive Guidance. Protrusive Guidance, if you're brand new to the podcast, is our little family. It's our little home on the internet via the web browser or even its native app via Android or iOS. All dentists and students can join it, but if you wanna verify yourself as a student, you have to email student at protrusive.co.uk so when you apply to join the network which is on protrusive.app once you apply you fill in some details you explain that I'm a student and then you should email student at protrusive.co.uk with some proof that you're a student that way we will add you to our secret space called Protrusive Vault so as part of your benefit of being a student on Protrusive Network you had access to a paid space there's also student clinical videos which we'll be adding soon as well as more episodes just like this one Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Galati. Protrusive Students is part of the Protrusive Dental Podcast. If you are a dental student, don't hoard this. Share it with your colleagues. Eventually, they're going to find out anyway, so you might as well be that person who shared it with them. I'm hoping that on Protrusive Guidance, we can help you on your journey. Look, there's almost a thousand dentists so far on Protrusive Guidance, and these are the nicest and geekiest dentists in the world. And by being someone who is a keen learner, who listens to this podcast, right? Not everyone does, right? Only those who self-select themselves as a keen learner listens to stuff like this. And so it's time for you to meet your tribe and start learning and growing together. Now, in this episode, which was supposed to be released in February, but life got busy with kids, it's actually adhesive dentistry. Questions from Emma Hutchison all around the topic of adhesive dentistry. Like, for example, some of the things we're going to cover is the longevity of composites. This is such a fundamental thing. And, and all, actually, what I love about doing these series now with Emma is everything she's asking is so foundational that even the dentist listening and watching, I think, will gain from this. So let's go ahead and join the main interview with Emma, all about Adhesive Dentistry from a student's perspective. And I'll catch you on Protrusive Guidance. So Emma, have you started on the clinics yet? So we're talking about Adhesive Dentistry today and you've got some questions for me. Yep. Have you done your first composite on a patient yet? I have, yes. I've actually been quite lucky. I've had quite a few patients. So I've done maybe about 10 composites so far. I know some of my friends have had zero, so I've actually been very lucky. At the start of my third year, I had some good patients. Very good. Well, you, you've done 10, but you've seen thousands, right, from your experience in, in nursing, well, which, which, is, yeah. which is great. So you get even, even more from that. So you would have seen yeah. different bonding systems being used uh, yeah. and whichever one you're using at dental school. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a curious thing here. This wasn't scripted, but what when you're doing your bonding stages, like your etching, mm -hmm. bonding, everything, what's going through your mind? What are you thinking about? What I'm thinking about is just, I'm a nervous hummer, so... You know that I'm I'm concentrating, I'm going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm just so in the zone. You just need to, you know, especially early on, I'm just concentrating so hard. I come out, I've got a sore jaw after, but honestly, it's just etch prime and bond, etch prime and bond, just repeating that in my head over and over, but at just total concentration mode. I forget it after I'm concentrating so hard. I remember working on the clinics as a student and this is like mm -hmm. our first year in the clinic and the de dental student and the bay behind me, I won't name and shame him, I don't want to embarrass him, but the patient left. He was like, oh no, I forgot, I forgot to bond. I, I etched oh. and I put my composite, but I forgot to put the bond. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll never forget that. So I see what you mean, yeah, etch prime bond. Don't, don't forget the stages because when bond. you're so new, no. exactly. But you know, I, I, the reason I ask you that, Emma, is because what goes through my mind is is, is a bit... Interesting, I think, but scientific. And I just wondered, are there any other dentists out there? Maybe if you guys are watching on the new platform, just comment below whether this is, this is you or not. I am imagining, you know, they're scanning electron microscope images uh, of dentine yeah. and stuff. Right? Yeah. I've got these tubules in my mind. And then as I'm doing the etching, I'm, I'm seeing these enamel, like uh, etched enamel, like the, the, the sort yeah. of uh, scanning electron microscope part of it. And then when I'm uh, putting my, my primer, I'm seeing that hybrid layer being formed. So that's yeah. what I'm visualizing. I, I don't know if I'm the only one who does that. I'm just trying not to cry at this point. <laughs> no, I'm kidding on. I'm kidding on. I love it. Um, I just need to, you know, just etch prime and bonds, etch prime and bonds. Because if you miss, if you miss that, then you know your patient will be back in next week. <laughs> Look, when, when you start, when you start endo, your head will explode. Uh. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> we've been doing endo down on the phantom heads and things, and it's just oh, so 
I'm dreading no, I'm I won't say I'm dreading it. I'm looking forward to it. first yeah, end of patient, but it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it is. What what this chat reminds me of is I remember being a third year student and I was I was living with fifty year students at the time, so it's pretty great. Mm-hmm. I was like constantly getting advice and stuff, right? Yeah. So you finished your morning lectures, I'd come home and I literally lived in a flat like two minutes walk from the dental school, right? In Sheffield. Oh, it was amazing. Perfect. And there we are, standard, you know, you get a bit of sandwich and you start playing FIFA as you do, right? So I'm playing FIFA with the fifth year dentist and I say to him, Look, when do you get to a stage where you don't have to like do a step by step memory of exactly what you have to do next in endo and he and he said I'm still not there yet but I'm almost there and then yeah. when you speak to when I used to speak to dentists when I was a dentist it was like hey you know endo yeah you know you don't have to memorize it it just comes instinctively it's like something that yeah. you just gets etched into your brain and it does happen eventually and now you can you yeah. know when I'm doing a composite you don't have to think about the different steps it's just part of the procedure you've done it thousands yeah. of times so don't worry mm-hmm. it will normalize it's like Good. driving you Good. get you don't think about it anymore <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, eventually, eventually it'll all, it'll all fall into place. <laughs> it certainly will. Now, Emma, you've got some questions for me, depending on time. Yep. Uh, you've got some questions for me that are going to make uh, this topic tangible. I'm actually excited to cover these because I think this this will generally make a really good educational mm-hmm. episode in dentistry in general. So uh, yeah. it will be nice to serve students and dentists together in this episode. So come at me. Okay, so my first question sort of spawns from it was our first day or our first lecture of second year. And bearing in mind, this was the first time we had been in the dental hospital because in first year it was COVID. So I didn't get into the dental school until second year. And then we had a year out. So that was technically my third year of university. And I remember our first ever lecture was on boarding systems. And I'm sitting there in the lecture theater. I'm like, what is going on? I've had no introduction to composite, no introduction to anything. And everyone was just sort of like, what? I remember thinking it was just a bit, a bit mind-boggling. And then obviously I understand we need to know all these different protocols, H prime bond protocols, but there's just so many different, different things that we've covered. You know, you've got like your total etch, your self etch, selective etching, different steps, two, three steps, etch and rinse bonding systems. So I just wanted to know. Would you use different protocols in different situations? Like, what are the basics? What are the most common protocols? What do you do yourself, your day-to-day? Great question. Really real-world questions. And I think where I'm going to start to answer this is, in the real world, believe it or not, I mean, it's really good to know all this stuff, by the way. I think dental materials is like that one textbook that you still keep even when you qualify, because it's really nice to, to, to connect with it. And we're using dental, dental materials every day, which are ever improving and it's great. But to have the foundational science behind it is good. What you'll find is that wherever you get a job, when you start practice mm-hmm. or you start working as associate, you're kind of at the mercy to whoever made a decision at one point in that practice, be it a group of associates or be it a principal, about which dental bonding system that they're going to adapt in okay. in that practice. And so every yep. surgery is stocked up with that same one usually, right? It just for, for Think about stock. Like when you were nursing, sure. like if there was five different types of bond, I mean, they'd expire, there'd be a, a, a ordering issue. It just, you know, did you ever work in a practice where they had different types of bonds or was it just usually one or two bonds? I've mostly worked in mixed NHS private practices and usually there's one for private patients and there's one for NHS patients. That's about it, really. That's about it. Okay. That's all that I can remember. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so there was like one or two, basically. And, and generally, that's usually how it is. And so you mm-hmm. are at the mercy of whichever supplier had that, you know, buy three bonds, get two free offer. And then the, the, the practice said, okay, let's go okay. for it. Let's buy a year's supply of bond. And so yeah. the most important thing is figure out which bond it is you're using, okay, the actual name of it, and download the DFUs, the directions for use. Right. Okay. The most important thing I think is whichever system you're using, please use it in the way that the manufacturer intended it to get those bond yeah. strengths. Okay. The biggest sin you can do is, uh, like for example, we were saying earlier, you know, H prime bond, H prime bond, uh, that kind of stuff. But imagine you are using a what I'm using, like I'm using a G premier bond. I think it's like a sixth or seventh generation, right? It's okay. like the newer generation. Okay. I don't even know exactly which generation it is, but I know exactly how to use it. Right. That's more mm-hmm. important for me. It is a um, self etch, okay? And so the worst thing you could do is use your phosphoric acid etch on the dentine. Right, okay. Wait 15 seconds, wash it away, and then use this bond. You've dramatically reduced the bond strength. Mm-hmm. Big time. Okay. okay. Because the directions are you do not etch the dentine here. 
right? That's okay. specifically the direction you do not etch the dentine. You actually weaken mm. your bond strength that way. The self uh, etching primer, it does all that kind of stuff for you with the dentine. And so what I'm using at the moment is a G Premier Bond because that's what we <laughs> decide as a practice that we like GC products, okay? And it served us well. And so what I would do typically is once it's all clean, what I mean by clean is <laughs> personally, I'm using air abrasion. Are you familiar with what okay. air abrasion is? Yeah, I've worked with dentists that use air abrasion a lot, yeah. So I'm using like you know, 27 micron or 50 micron aluminum oxide particles blasted. Mm-hmm. What that does is it, the most important thing is it gets things clean, right? Yep. You get rid of the biofilm. That's the, the most important thing. And supposedly it gets a nicer structure of dentine to, 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 to bond to. Uh, that's actually d- debated, but you definitely remove the biofilm, which I think is the most important thing. Yeah. So I've got a nice clean surface. I've got rubber dam isolation. Right? Mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in rubber dam isolation only because like you look away and if you don't have rubber dam isolation, that's when I'm stressed. Like the, the patient's tongue goes there, it, it fills the saliva, the, the gingiva starts to bleed into the cavity. It's just a, a stressful. It's more about stress. Yeah. My mental health and stress will benefit from having rubber dam on. So I've got yeah. my rubber dam on, I've got my air abrasion on. And so what I would do is I would use my etch first on the enamel only. It's because okay. that's because of the system that I'm using. So w- whichever system you're using, follow that. But the system I'm using, I will do a selective etch technique, i.e. I am selecting, I am choosing to etch the enamel only. Okay. Then I will uh, wash it. So I will typically wait 20 seconds to 30 seconds. Okay. I will wash okay. it and then I'll observe that frosty enamel. Okay. I Perfect. want to see that frosty enamel. Okay. Not overly frosty, but you just want to see some degree of frost, frost there. Then I will get my G Premier Bond. Okay. So I don't, there's not a separate priming stage and a separate bonding stage. Like a fourth okay. generation one will be Optibond FL, which is supposedly the gold standard. Right. Have you heard of the Optibond FL? Have you, have you, have you heard of it? I've heard of Optibond. But not Optibond. Yeah. It may be the same thing that I've heard of yet. Yeah. Probably. I mean, they have Optibond Solo and they have a few different varieties of stuff. But the one of the ones that a lot of pedantic dentists like to use sure. is Optibond FL because the initial research in the 90s and 2000s was like, wow, this is amazing. And yeah. people, once you have a system that you can trust and things work, okay. it'll be silly to deviate away from it. And so the way that one works is that you do a total etch. Total etch is when you okay. etch the enamel. And you etch the dentine. And typically what you do is you etch the enamel first. Then by yep. the time you get to etching the dentine and then you wash it, that means the enamel had more time than dentine. Is that what you do at the moment? Yes, that's what we've been taught at class school. Yeah. Do you know what bond you're using at the moment in the clinic? No. <laughs> I that's should, okay. I should, but it's, I know it's got a pink or a purple cap. That's all I know. That's totally cool, Emma. That's totally cool. Yes. I, I don't remember the bond I use at Dentsquin. If you ask me when I've done 10 composites in, l- listen, as long as I've got something to, as long as I remember to use the damn thing, I'm happy, right? So, yeah. so, so, so these are the things, you know, whichever one that we in the real world, when you get there, it will be so different to what you used in dental school that yeah. you must take a moment to pause and look at the directions for use. So, so the, back to the Optibond FL, you do the total etch, which is the, mm-hmm. the etching, the enamel, then the dentine. Then you do the primer stage separate okay get nice and dry another coat get nice and dry okay. you don't wash that that way then you put the separate bond adhesive okay, okay? so the primer goes into the tubules okay, okay. Uh, and then it links to the adhesive that you put on next and then that okay. hybrid layer is formed right okay. then you put the composite on top whereas what i'm doing okay. back on the the newer generation is everything's in that one bottle so after i have okay. selective etched the enamel only we've put the g premium bond which has got the prime and the bond everything inside there and it's got the etching ability to self etch the dentine okay yeah then i will dry it and it, this stuff goes to like four microns thin so super thin and we will cure it and then we'll go proceed with it with, with our composite restoration so the real world lesson here is to make sure whichever system you're using you make sure that you you follow the directions and if, if for those of you who want to really get deeper into this but in a, in a really tangible episode there's an episode that i did with a guy called da- david jadol so the episode we call it i can't believe this sticks extreme bonding it was pdp 077 i would encourage anyone listening to this right now and you're interested in learning more about what you know what are the most important things to do and what dr jadol said was that as long as you get the tooth clean and rough out of the six different things that you're trying to do when you're bonding something the two most important is clean no biofilm and what he meant by rough is get the nice etch pattern like optimize mm-hmm. your surface to, to, to bond okay. to and if you can do that things will stick so we talk about air abrasion we talk about etching protocols and that kind of stuff uh, and so the whole bonding thing whichever one you're using nowadays they're 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 newer they're supposedly better uh, mm-hmm. the issue Emma, with using the more gold standard fourth generation earlier bonding is it's technique sensitive. 
Yeah. Right. You have to get you know the whole what we call wet bonding, where you have to mm -hmm. make sure you don't over dry the dentine, and the risk of over drying the dentine increases when you've etched it. If you've etched it and now you have to wash it and then you have to dry it. You know, how do you yeah. know you haven't over dried it and whatnot? That's why it's supposedly technique sensitive. So the newer ones actually make it a lot easier for me. Yeah. Okay. That makes total sense. That's good to know, actually, because I've never seen anyone do the separate prime, the separate bonds. I'd never even heard of that. And then when they're talking about it in this, maybe that's the drawback of doing dental nursing, actually. I've never seen that before. So putting that into context for me was really, really difficult, actually. So no, that's good to know. Just follow your your manufacturer's guidance and don't just take any random bond and use it willy-nilly. <laughs> And what if you could do for this for me, Emma, for homework for the next monthly mm -hmm. um, episode is I want you to find out exactly which bond you're using. Let's look okay. at the directions for use together for that one. OK, and let's evaluate what you were doing well and what you weren't doing well on your first term composite yeah. so we can actually learn together. If you don't mind, yeah. that could be a nice reflective yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. You know what? You asked a good question, which I didn't answer. Would I use something different in different scenarios? Personally, I don't because we just, that's what we have, right? Like the real yeah. world answer, that's what we have. That's what we use. And some are biomimetic dentists are like, oh, Jazz, you shouldn't be using that bond. You don't get as high yeah. as bond strengths as like clear fill or, or that kind of stuff, which I get. But I have heard this thing on some webinars that I went on whereby if you have got some caries, which is not close to the pulp, which is okay. not closer to pulp, then in those scenarios, you should consider using a gold standard total etch. So we're etching the enamel and the dentine. Okay. If you are in a scenario where you've got deep caries close to the pulp, then okay. the theory is perhaps we don't want to put that 37% phosphoric acid etch right okay. next to the pulp, right? So right. Uh, that makes sense to me. And then for those, you might decide to use a self-etch, which actually when I heard that like, you know, five, six years ago, it made a lot of sense to me. But yeah. in the real world, do people do that? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I've just never had the conversation. I just sort of pass what I'm, what I'm supposed to pass. So... No, that's good to know. Very interesting, very interesting. The next question I had for you, Jazz, was we've talked a lot about like post-op sensitivity can last for quite a few weeks. Do you think, do you notice that there's any certain patient populations or specifically situations where post-op sensitivity is more likely and how do you address this? Again, fantastic question. The only thing that comes to mind to me is people with cheese molars, MIH. Have you heard of MIH? Yeah. So molar incisor hypomineralization. And, and these yeah. molars, which are for, for those dentists who might be not familiar with this, this is when at the point of development, when the, <laughs> when the enamel is developing on the sixes and the centrals and whatnot, uh, is hypomineralized. There's not enough mineral content. These teeth are weaker and there's different sort of degrees of it. It's mild, moderate, severe kind of stuff. And if it's severe, as the tooth erupts, the enamel is just breaking away and that tooth's got to come out. Whereas if it's mild, they have like these yellow patches and white patches <laughs> on it. With the, and the yellow patches is why they're called cheese molars typically these teeth can be a bit more difficult to numb and what I have found and what I've read is that they will be a bit more prone to post-op sensitivity so that's the, the first thing that comes to mind the yeah. other one that comes to mind for me and I don't know if this is evidence-based or not is people with um, pre-existing cracks in their teeth Okay. Right? If you've got a crack in the tooth, especially if it's a, a wide one or deep one, then that nerve is already upset, especially if they've already got symptoms of <laughs> cracked tooth syndrome. You know, every time they chew something hard, they feel like some, some sensitivity. That pulp might already be upset. Deep caries, especially if they're already symptomatic. Whenever I yeah. look at a tooth and I think... <laughs> what risk level should I inform my patient, right? So should I tell my patient that you are low risk of needing a root canal? Are you a high risk of needing a root canal? The number one thing I look at is how deep is the caries? And if it's really close to the nerve, then not only is their risk of root canal treatment going to be higher, pulp necrosis, but also it just makes sense that the settling period might be longer. And I, I think, yeah. generally speaking, Emma, my patients don't, thankfully, experience post-op sensitivity very much. And I think okay. the reason for that is I got anything, just like Damage Adole taught us, get everything clean and rough. <laughs> so I'm using rubber dam isolation. I'm not allowing that saliva yep. or blood to touch my cavity. Super, super clean. Following my bonding protocols rigidly. I'm doing the air abrasion. Okay. So I'm trying to do everything really gold standard here. And I'm not rushing it. Yep. It easily will take me 45 minutes plus to do these restorations. And so my experience of post-op sensitivity, because I do like to ask my patients when they come back, has been pretty good over the last in 11 years dentistry especially even more that as i've developed as a dentist but mm -hmm. people with deep caries i would expect it it's just it just it's as a given and perhaps people with cracks that's the only ones i, I, I can think okay. of but thankfully when you follow good bonding principles 
Okay. Is, no, is not normal. You know, if someone's saying that, oh, you know, post-op sensitivity is normal and every single patient will get it, then I think I would look at the protocols. Are they using their bonding agent properly? Okay. Are they perhaps etching yeah. the dentine where they're using a self-etch bonding agent and that would then lead to, to, to these sensitivity problems? Are they, oh, the other thing I do, Emma, is when you're placing composite, if you don't mind me asking, what have you been taught in terms of the exact way to do it so you, you don't remove but you reduce the impact of that polymerization shrinkage or the polymerization stress? Very small increments. You know your depth of cure around about two millimetres, definitely not any more than that. When you're not trying to like connect the walls together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, again? it makes sense. You're not, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're not doing like, for example, you wouldn't join the buckle and the lingual wall straight yeah. off the bat and, and yeah. cause that shrinkage stress. And, and that's that's yeah. correct. I, I, I would agree with that. So it also depends mm -hmm. on how you're placing it. Anything mm -hmm. else? Make sure you're doing your full cures. Don't ever, you know, I, I know some people do the 10 seconds and then build up the other cusp. Do that 10 seconds so that your first increment gets 20 seconds. Fine, but sort of just making sure that everything's fully cured. You don't want that. I don't know in Glasgow we call it a soggy bottom. I don't know if that, yeah, there you go. No soggy bottoms, no thanks. Yeah, very small increments, just taking your time with it and building it up nice and slowly. Great principles there. So yeah, don't join the walls together, smaller increments. Yeah. It all makes sense. What I found is that when you look at radiographs of your work some years later, mm -hmm. you find these little air voids and air bubbles in there. Right. Because okay. like I imagine as a dentist student, you're not heating your composite, right? You're just using normal cold composite, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you if you work on like a I don't know, a tooth model that's clear and you use these clear bands and you start doing these increments and if you can, you can see the, the the actual composite in place, you'll notice that when you add one increment and then you add another increment and when you whatever instrument you use and then you retract it, sometimes the composite gets pulled away a bit mm -hmm. or the to two increments they don't meet together beautifully. The wettability isn't there. And so you get these yeah. little voids, right? Which which is not ideal. And if that void happens at that sort of where the hybrid layer area is, you might get more sensitivity, right? It just it just makes sense if you haven't been able to do that. So what I've been doing for the last seven years is something called snow plow technique. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't, no. So a, a dentist called Dave Winkler taught me through this and I used to work for him in Windsor uh, and he used to teach a lot on composites and, you know, fantastic dentists. And then, uh, then I started to read the literature behind it. A lot of great dentists do this, whereby before, so you've, you've done your whole etch bond, it's ready to now put your composite in. Before <laughs> I put my composite in, which by the way, I am using heated composite, in, in, in practice yeah. again to get more wettability right mm -hmm. you know some, something that's uh, hard and stiff and cold compared to something's warm it's just gonna get in all the nooks and crannies right so that's also helping to reduce this uh, void issue I will put a tiny tiny teeny weeny drop of flowable first then I will put my composite increment okay and then I will adapt it and cure and then before the next increment again a tiny any little bit of a uh, uh, flowable composite and so that's called the snow ply technique basically and so um that's I've i think seen people really, doing really, that uh, yeah yeah because you've seen yeah. that in practice yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen people do that, yeah. It just makes sense to me. And, and so I've been doing this for <laughs> years and I feel as though maybe that, that that may or may not be relevant. I don't know if the study's been done versus snowplow technique versus no snowplow mm -hmm. where that actually really makes a difference. But in terms of my radiographs, I've seen that issue. I used to have these little random uh, voids. Uh, that's definitely been right. eliminated. Okay, cool. So is that something that you would only really use with heated composite? Sure. Um, you can use that snowplow technique even without heated composite. In fact, I think the yeah. need for it probably gets even higher when you don't have okay. the, the benefit yeah. of the heated composite, right? But mm. I, I, I just like this, the way it all seamlessly mixes together so nicely, uh, which yeah. actually takes me to my next point. What are you using as a dental student to adapt your composite? So you put your increment, what instruments are you using now to actually get the composite where you wanted to go in the cavity? So I am actually not just saying this, I'm a big fan of a, of a flat plastic. But then also I've found just a dry micro brush. I quite like a dry micro brush. One of the dentists I work with, He's a huge Patrice Sarati. Actually, he was the person who said to me, you should definitely go for this job. You should do it. He's a huge nerd. Give a um, shout out. Give a name. Oh, his name's Piers Hannigan. <laughs> of course it is. Hello, Piers. Good to see you. <laughs> He's a huge Patrice Sarati. So he is just a huge fan of just using a dry micro brush. And I've been trying it and it's just, you know, getting into all these wee bits and bobs. I'm still sort of, I'm definitely still in that realm of figuring out what works for me. But a flat plastic and a micro brush are my sort of holy grails at the moment. 
I'm the same. So I'm using a micro brush. So uh, I knew okay. when you said that you use a micro brush, that I knew that's not something that you would have picked up from dental school. I knew someone in the yeah. real world uh, would yeah. have taught you that. And so shout out to Pierce for his great advice, something that um, Jason Smithson taught me years ago. So yes, when you're adapting the composite, when you use a micro brush, some of the reported benefits of this is uh, it, you don't get that. It doesn't stick to the micro brush. So yeah, it doesn't sort of pull sure. up. And also, if you look at it, like you use something like something spiky on the composite and it mm. makes this like a rough even within the composite ready for the next increment now just so we know a reported disadvantage of using a micro brush is when you look at uh, you know those scanning electron microscopes you have these your composite is a bit hairy like the, okay. the micro fibers yeah. are actually breaking off into the composite so what we know is try and use a more expensive higher quality micro brushes rather than okay. the cheap ones because that might be more of an issue with the cheap ones so just in case everyone starts to switch make sure using a nice okay. micro brush that's going to be strong enough okay no that makes sense yes yeah, suppose you don't want hairy hairy composite so that's right. And so I think all these things together are what reduce your post-op sensitivity. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Is that something that you would ever, I know you're saying it doesn't happen to you that much, but is that something that you would put in a consent form? Is it just something you generally mention at the end of an appointment? When do you address that? Every time. Mm. So, so, Every um, time. so there's always a pre-chat. Right, there's always like a, yeah. a debris before we start the, the restoration. So my, usually, I've got the photo of their tooth because at True. the at the checkup, I would have taken a photo of the tooth, showing the caries, showing the issue. So I've got the photo on the big screen already as they walk in, and I say, "Mr. Smith, do you remember what we're doing today?" And usually, my patients are like, "I have no idea what you're doing today." That, they, yeah. <laughs> they don't remember; they've got memories yeah. like like fish. So they come in and say, like, "Have a look at this tooth." Right? I, I describe them. Can you see that there's a bit of discoloration? There's an issue over here. And they're like, "Oh yes, yeah. Oh, now I remember. Yes, we're doing a filling." So like, yes, uh, and then I show them the radiograph, saying, "Okay, based on." The fact that you're not in pain at the moment and you're not having sensitivity and it's not super close to the nerve, the chance of your nerve dying after this and needing something called a root canal is thankfully low. It's not okay. it's not zero, but it's low. And then obviously I do the reverse and I really uh, exaggerate it in terms of, okay, mm -hmm. the, this decay is really close to your nerve. This is really bad news. We are doing CPR for the tooth here. We're going to give it okay. the best shot we can, but if the tooth dies... Don't worry, there's a solution we can still help you, but here's the things that we should watch out for afterwards kind of thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then I'll remind him at the end as well that, okay, Mrs. Smith, it's totally normal to have a bit of sensitivity to hot and cold for a couple of weeks. It will settle. Yeah. The bite will feel a bit funny initially. It will settle. Be careful not to bite your lip when you have food today. The, the usual stuff that you will always, yeah. always, always say. And, yeah. and so there was another podcast we did, actually, Consent is Like an Onion. Right, sure. consent is like an onion. I don't know if you listen to that one. Uh, and Sean said this amazing thing in terms of what patients remember from the appointment, and what they remember is peak end. There's two things that patients sure. remember from an, any dental appointment is the peak, the, the highlight of the appointment. You know, was it a funny joke? Was it something bad that happened? Like they can remember the peak of that appointment and the end. So it's really important to, to okay. utilize the end and end mm -hmm. on a high to to make sure that they remember an end with the most important bits. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, save it all till the end. <laughs> but that sort of overlaps um, with my next question, talking about how do you assess, suppose, predict the longevity of your adhesive restorations in your patients? Like, are there specific maintenance or follow up protocols that you recommend just to make, you know, enhance the durability of your restorations over time? That's an interesting question in terms of, I think we're coming to is that, like, okay, when we see the patients again, check up after check up, sure. what should we be watching out for? Is there anything that, is there any way that we can intervene to, yeah. to help these patients get the most? I think there are a few things actually that we can talk about here, but, but let's take a, a step back. How long, when, we, when I place in a posterior composite, how long do I expect it to last? And I think this figure in my mind has changed a lot over the years as I've gained more experience sure. and read more things. In terms of what you've been taught, I don't know if you've been taught this or have seen this in terms of the research or in terms of what the lecturers have taught you at dental school, how long should these fillings last? I don't think I could tell you. I don't think I could tell you. So five years? <laughs> I don't know. And, 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 and so let, let, let's start with that. So some of the, the key literature that I was looking up for in preparation for this episode was a, was a guy called Nick Obdan, who's yep. done lots of great work on, on longevity of restorations and comps and whatnot. In fact, funny story, when I was a DCT, like one or two years out of dental school, there was this conference at King's uh, and Nick Obdan was there and I came up with him and like I was like, like, you're a total celeb. Can I get a selfie with you? And it must have been the first ever selfie a dentist has ever taken with him. 
right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, that, he was completely taken aback. He's like, what? Someone wants a selfie with me? Like, how do you know who I am? My face is never on in all these papers that I write. But I recognized it. I saw his name and I saw the lecture. I was like, oh my God, this is Nick Optam. Yeah. He's a legend, right? So I, I'll see if I can dig out that photo. I'm going to go with my Google Photos That's from like 2014 and, and see if I can dig out this photo, actually. So anyway, absolute legend. And in, I think 2007, he did this uh, retrospective study where they looked okay. at almost 3,000 restorations done by two dentists. Oh. Uh, and, and they followed it up. And I'm just going to see if I can get numbers. I don't want to say anything wrong here in terms of their good work. But it was 82% longevity okay, of composite uh, at 10 years. Okay, so 82% okay. at 10 years. Uh, and for amalgam, interestingly, it was 79%. Okay, And I think okay. that what counts as a failure is uh, caries, fracture, uh-huh. and sometimes with an amalgam, the tooth fractures rather than the amalgam, right? So that would be a failure. And so 82% at 10 years, we can make what we can of it. But what are the, the, the things to consider was the annual failure rate of 1% to 3% is generally what's said in the literature. So every year, you know, right. 1% to 3% of composites will, will fail. But the most important thing, I think, to, to come to directly answer what you're saying is when the restorations perform the worst is patients with high caries risk. And on cases okay. whereby you had to do more than one surface. So every additional surface that you had to do. So if it's just an occlusal, great. If it's an MO, okay, okay. still okay. If it's an MOB, ooh, okay, that's stretching it a bit. If it's an MOBL, okay. right? It's an MODBL. Like the more surfaces yeah. that are involved <laughs> in a composite, the, the more complex it becomes. Trying to get a good contact point. I don't know if you've found this on your restorations. Have you done like class twos already? We don't actually, is that Black's classification? We don't use Black's classification really? anymore. Really? My no, God, what do you use? We don't. Uh, just whatever surfaces it is. M-O, M-O-D-O. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't use Black's classification anymore. So That's I'm mad. always Googling when I'm editing your episodes. I'm always Googling what's what. <laughs> <laughs> that's so that's alien really to me. Well. That's crazy. I yeah. didn't expect that. Okay, fine. So an M O or a Dio, have you done any interproximal on posterior teeth? Yes, yeah, I have, yeah. I think one day we can talk about matrix selection and that kind of stuff. I think that would be uh-huh. really good, connecting the real world. But you probably have one or two matrices available in dental school to use for posterior, right? Which ones, uh, do you know which ones? Do you know the names of them? We've only got one, actually. What are they called? Begins with an O. Omnimatrix. Uh, yeah, we've got Omnimatrix, I think. Yeah, just the standard Omnimatrix. And then your clear cellulose strips, and that's about it, really. <laughs> That's and when a, you've done your restorations, you, have you done some MOs or DOs yet? I've done one. Okay. All the others and, have and, actually and, been anterior, so... Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. So, no, well, just one. Um, one thing that I would str- struggle with, even struggle now, you know, it's, it's I mean, I'm much better now. And I've got some videos I even recorded yesterday, actually, which I'll upload to the, the portal uh, of just getting a lovely tight contact. And the way, the way <laughs> you can check for a tight contact is not... Yeah, it, it helps to floss and see, okay, how tight it is. But even more important is you try and bring the floss out and does it click on the way out, right? Does the floss mm-hmm. st- hang there? That's a really good test to see if you've got okay. a nice tight contact. And so as a dental student, we were using a sick sickvalin, the sickvalin, whatever you, the way you want to call it. And, yeah. and we were doing mm-hmm. amalgams back then. And then, yeah, some composites. And I was really saddened by the contact points I was getting like floss was passing right through and I was like oh my god the patient's gonna get food packing recurrent caries Mm -hmm. and stuff but but what we know is that more important than our skill more important than how well you do the restoration is the patient's caries risk yeah okay so caries risk and the more surfaces involved so the number one thing we can do for our patients to make sure that they get as long as possible from their Uh restoration is trying to actively work on reducing their caries risk, right? So all the usual things, diet advice, be very meticulous with their oral hygiene, keep giving them the coaching Uh that they need, fluoride application. If you can do this, it will make the restoration last longer. The other thing is making sure the patient takes ownership of it. The patient needs to understand that, okay, I've done the restoration, but now the restoration belongs to you and you need to look after it. And I think yep. that's uh, the most important thing. Just to share some more studies, actually, with, with Nick Hopdam, he then also did a systematic review meta-analysis. They only include studies that had five plus years follow-up. And there okay. were like eight authors, again, about 3,000 restorations approximately. And the same thing, they found caries risk and, and how many surfaces were the most significant predictors uh, of failure. So once you've done a multiple surface composite, the only real way to, to improve your success rate in the future is upgrading that to an indirect restoration that covers the, the cusp and stuff, right? So that's one way. You know, okay. certainly if you've pushed the boundaries, maybe because, Emma, you might be at a scenario where you've got deep caries and you don't want to do a crown. 
right? Because, mm-hmm. you, you know, this tooth might need root canal. And so yeah. you might do what we call a posh core, right? You do a giant, ginormous composite and you try your best. And we see, okay, at the one-year mark, is the nerve still alive or is it has it gone kaput? And if it's still okay, you might then say, okay, there's no pain, there's no issues, but this composite is going to fracture. It's just too big. It's, it's, it's not fit for purpose. We should now do an overlay or an onlay. And that would be a, okay. a, a good thing to do to reduce your fracture risk. And to reduce your caries risk would be the, the, all the things that we talk about prevention. Anyway, back to that study, they found an annual failure rate. And this is the most important thing. Annual failure rate of 4.6% on people with high caries risk and 1.6% on uh, patients with low risk. I mean, that is, okay. that is really, really a big, big huge difference. Okay. Okay. So there's loads of different factors, but the main takeaway is I suppose you can do the most beautiful composite or restoration in the world, but if they've got a higher caries risk, then it might not last as long as someone that doesn't. Okay. That makes sense. And if it's bigger, you're more yeah. likely to run into fractures and issues. Yeah. And so the, the larger a restoration gets, the more the tendency to go towards something like an indirect restoration of crown. Although there are other okay. parameters, which I know we will be talking out, uh, about one day as well. The other yeah. thing to consider is when would a composite fracture? And a composite would fracture is perhaps if it's been placed quite thin, right? Thicker okay. the composite, it's going to have more strength, right? And so maybe if you've not added enough thick bulk because you've tried to be an ultra conservative, you might then get that failure of a fracture. Uh, okay. Or uh, here's an important one, which I didn't learn for a few years after dental school, is when you look at your cavity, is everything nice and smooth on that floor, right? If there's like sharp, spiky bits of dentine Pretty sticking cool. out, perhaps you remove an old amalgam, right? You move an old amalgam and there's spiky yeah. bits of dentine, just get your you know, rugby ball red burr and smooth that sharp bit away, right? Because okay. when you're putting your composite on, it likes this nice, smooth surface. It doesn't want the, these sharpnesses, which leads to my final point, uh, which is not evidence-based. Mm-hmm. Not evidence-based in terms of outcome, but evidence-based in terms of process, which is what burrs we use mm-hmm. on, on the teeth. Any guidelines that you've been shown or decision making in terms of when you're removing caries, or when you're treating a tooth, what kind of burrs are you using? What kind of shape of burrs are you using? So I'd say up on our main restorative clinic, we've got all your all your usual burrs, like your rounds, your Fisher burrs. I have seen burrs, you know, out there working as a nurse that I've never seen in the dental hospital, which is fair enough, I suppose. But a lot of clinicians will have different opinions on what you should be using in certain situations. Like, I'll be using a large round burr to do something and the clinician will come in and say, I really think you should be using a Fisher burr. But I don't think, I really don't think I've had that much experience in terms of mm. using loads of different types of burrs. Just your your standard ones, really. So The, the, the main takeaway here, Emma, is like, the sh- if you look at the shape of the burr, Mm-hmm. Things that are round in nature, so pear shape and round, are more mm-hmm. favorable before composites than your sort of uh, fisher burrs or square mm-hmm. rectangular tipped because yep. if you imagine cutting tooth structure away with the rectangular one, the corner that it has it actually causes these micro fractures in the teeth and oh, okay. you, you're, you get left with these sharp bits mm-hmm. in the cavity. If you're using a round burr, you're less likely to have those sharp bits and things are likely to be smoother. So a little thing like that, okay. basically, which, we, again, is more process-driven than outcome-driven, yeah. but these little yeah. things. And if you look at all the things, like how can, what can we do to make sure at the time of restoration we reduce the failure rate? Well, I think, again, going back to, again, isolation, Nice, clean and rough. So following mm-hmm. the bonding protocol, reading the directions for you, so bringing together the entire episode that we discussed so far. And making mm-hmm. sure you do get a nice contact. And we'll talk more about contact points in the future. So make sure you get a nice contact so you don't get food trapping there, right? Uh, yep. And you coach the patient so that whatever caused the caries, it doesn't happen again. You lower the patient's caries risk. And make sure okay. that when you are doing your restoration, it's thick enough and it's not on a bed of, of, of you know sharp dentine, that everything is nice and smooth. And with these foundational things, we're hoping to get beyond 80% at 10 yep. years. And that would be nice. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That's actually really, really hard for me to hear about the, the round birds, though, because I'm a fisher bird kind of gal, so that's hard for me to hear. Maybe higher up, for if you use a yeah. fisher bird on a fisher, it makes sense. Yeah. If you're using yeah. a fisher bird you know, down at the contact area, it doesn't make sense to me. 
Yeah. That's all. Okay. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's fine. Lots of good tips and tricks in there, Jess. What's the number one thing, Emma, that you think you're going to change about? And you know, change is harsh because you're so new to it all, right? I, I, I would just love to know what's your big takeaway from our chat today on the, the really good questions that you come up with. What's your big takeaway? I suppose the takeaway today is just know what you're using. You know, what prime and bond am I using? I don't know. So know what you're using, know how to use it. Look at the manufacturer's instructions. But yeah, just knowing what you're using, how to use it. Don't just, you know, stick with what you've had forever and use the same techniques for everything because all the materials are different for a different reason. So yeah, know what you're using and know how to use it. Perfect. And so next recording, we're going to find out which bond you do you think you'll find out by then, right? Yeah, yeah, which bond yeah. you're using and then we'll dig up the DFUs together and we'll have a look at, you know, what does this particular bond say? Uh, and so just to whet everyone's appetite for next month's episode mm-hmm. with Emma, we're going to be talking about documentation. And so I know... Mm-hmm. Photography and videography is, is not something that you really get to do as much uh, at Den School. But some things that we can talk about, maybe like documentation, what are the things that we're looking for? How do we do a routine checkup? What, do you think that yeah. would be useful? Like when you're actually doing checkups, what are we actually checking for? Would that be uh, helpful? Absolutely. Like one of the things that I found very hard at the beginning of third year, how do I do a checkup? And it's easy enough learning about it. In a lecture, you do this, this and this. But what does that actually look like with a patient? And, okay, I've done this, I'm going to do this now. Like, how do you actually communicate that with a patient? Yeah, like, just your steps. And I know you find your own little way to do it and your your own sequence, but how do you do a checkup? Like, that was one of my huge questions. And it seems so, so silly, like it's one of the basic things. It's but... not silly. I remember, Emma, I remember having this exact yeah. same thought. Like I remember being like a third or fourth year student and the tutor mm-hmm. coming and is doing the checkup. And I was really trying hard to watch exactly how they hold the mirror, yeah. exactly how they're holding the three in one and what they're trying, what are they actually looking at? How are they yeah. so quick? I was like, how, how are they just mm-hmm. so quick and looking around? Like, why am I taking like five minutes per tooth? So yeah. I'm super excited now to talk about mm-hmm. my checkup protocol. Uh, and yeah. the lesson uh, I can give you now, even before we record that is... There's a book out there and it's called The Art and Science of Treatment Planning. I haven't read it. I don't know if it's any good, but it is the art and the science. Okay. So what I mean by that mm-hmm. is that my checkup will be different to the other hundred of checkups that you've seen with a hundred other dentists. And have yeah. you ever seen a routine examination that's exactly identical between two clinicians? No, no never. Never. It's always a wee bit. It's always a wee bit different. Well, then I think it'll be really good to, for me to share. So it's part of documentation month. We'll share my checkup but also mm-hmm. i'd like to know about some quirks or some things that you've noticed with some dentists that you've worked with and yep. then we'll get everyone on the comment section to, to chip in i think this would make a really educational thing right now i might pick up a few things that some colleagues are doing that i'm not doing at the moment uh, and, and vice versa so i think spontaneously we've decided our next topic quite nicely yeah perfect perfect no i'm excited i'm really excited for it and just getting more and more i'm like a sponge at the minute just taking in all the time never lose that emma never ever lose that uh, about you it's so so important to have that enthusiasm and be like a sponge throughout your career um it will it will serve serve you well serve me well so far i'm still a sponge and i think not to insult the protrusionality but we are sponges we're all sponges uh (laughs) not sponges but sponges (laughs) (laughs) all right emma thank you so much i'll I'll see you next time thank you so much see you later well there we have it guys our first proper protrusive students episode thank you so much emma we've got those revisions notes promise in the crush your exam section of the protrusive guidance app once again you want to head to protrusive.app the website make your account make a free account and then email student at protrusive.co.uk with your proof that you're a student and try to join with your own personal email address so even after you're done with being a student like i know we're we're students forever i I get that but once you're no longer at 10 school you want to have your email address so you can continue to engage on protrusive guidance once you do that the team will invite you to the protrusive vault and of course you get access to the crush your exam section and the student clinical videos and lastly we'll see you on our own student forum so i'm excited to see the growth of protrusive students and i'd love to see where everyone's from right all i just envisage dental students from all around the world I remember some years ago when i was still early in podcasting this german dental student i bless her i forgot her name now but she reached out and she said that yours is my favorite english dental podcast and 
I don't know if she's qualified or not yet, but you know, those kind of interactions, wherever you're from in the world, it'll be great to have you on Protrusive Guidance. And I hope you gain from this. I hope you really, really gain from everything we're doing with Protrusive Students. And I would love for you to hit the like button or comment below if you're finding this helpful. We'll catch you same time next month for every monthly episode of A Protrusive Student. But of course, there's so many Protrusive episodes you can listen to in the meantime. Bye for now.